Okay, so this morning, I'm going to conclude on our Love, Dating, and Marriage series, which we started um, three weeks ago. This is week four. And um, I'm going to share with you a, me- a message I'm going to call this morning, Sour Love. Sour so I love. Okay, yeah, the excited people come for first service. I know you are, you are not my favorite service officially now. We've broken up. All right, okay, 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 okay. I want to share with you a message I'm going to call Sour so Love. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, apparently, there's this thing among um, young kids. I have a five year old and I have a four year old. And there's this thing among young kids, apparently, that they have this pretend life. They do this, they pretend on stuff. They, um, they act drama, so they're always trying to either act mommy and daddy, um, somebody, you be mommy, you be daddy, you know, those kind of stuff. But the one that kind of annoys me the most is when they start this thing, they will do pretend food. So they are cooking um, the food, they're waiting for spaghetti to be ready. And all they're doing is basically they're carrying books and, you know, just barrels and just very random things. And then they're waiting for spaghetti to be ready. And then my daughter can be so dramatic. She says that they're in a restaurant. She's a waiter or a waitress. And then she's serving um, um, rice and plantain. You know, she's just basically, sometimes I look at her and I say, you are, you know, but she's basically serving meals and doing all that kind of stuff, changing that. And she's asking her brother, do you prefer to have pancakes or to have rice? And then he too is making choices and they are cooking the food, placing orders, you know, delivering orders, serving it. They're tasting it. They're talking about how good the food tastes. And, 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 and all of that. And then sometimes she comes to me and wants to involve me in it. And then she's saying, Daddy, you have some pancakes here. Should I put syrup for you? I'm like, this food, this is what you are going to eat today. And you are not eating any other food in this house. And then she'll say to me, oh, come on, Daddy, it is just pretending. We're just pretending. It's just pretense, all right? Um, the other day we were by a beach. And then she's building this house. And she's talking about the people living in the house. And then I'm telling her, you are going to live in that sand castle. And then she says, come on, we are just pretending and all of that. Um, so I, I thought it was just my kids and at some point it was getting at me. So I, I put it on like our family group, my brothers, and I'm telling them that, look, I'm getting fed up with my daughter. And my brother is like, come on, every child does that. that in fact, every evening he eats this food that he has to, <laughs> he has to talk about how good it is or, and all of that and comment her cooking and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, I thought my daughter was losing it. Okay, so... Um, but some weeks ago, I was, on, I was on a flight with some kids. They were on the seat behind, on the row behind me. And then as we boarded the plane, there was like a delay in takeoff. They were just talking. I'm like, they were almost getting on my last nerve. Like, I'm trying to work. You guys are talking, like just talking. There's a reason I don't travel with my children. They are just talking, talking and all of that. And, you know, and basically talking about how they can fly, how they are Superman and they have superpowers and they can fly and blah, blah, blah. That I'll just take off. I'll go to the sky. I'll do that and they were just there were two kids they were just having a time of their life talking about it and all and their mom too was encouraging them and all and then we the plane now takes off so we just you know tack, i'm just bam take off and then we start going and then one of them is like you know they've been talking about flying and all one of them is now like um ayo, ayo, we're actually flying we're flying we're flying for real for real now for real like for real flying for real oh my god we are flying for real and I suddenly start realizing how people just build this whole pretend life and then like for real life, okay? So sometimes my daughter is talking and then she's now telling me, okay, this one is now for real. But it's not just a children thing, apparently. Even adults do it. So adults have this thing of, you know, you've seen something real life and then we create our own, what I call our own pretend version of the real life thing. Example, you are watching you a good movie, like some Hollywood movie. You are watching it. You saw how this couple goes on a date and all of that. And the thing was really doing it like, wow, you are getting, you can't do it. You can't go to the restaurants. They go and all of that. So you hear their single suya night and then you basically come on a low budget date, you put something inside and you're you feeling fly. You know, it's like the pretend version of the for real um, kind of thing. And I'm not mentioning people, I'm not pointing at anybody. Or another example is how sometimes, you know, you've been watching movies, you've been seeing winter and you see people all clad up in like winter jackets and, you know, wearing head warmers and puffing and all of that. And here you are in Nigeria, you know, you don't, but you just see small hamatan you know ibadon hamatan is not kanu hamatan small just ibadon hamatan and here you are wearing head warmer i'm like philip what's wrong with you you know like <laughs> like like head warmer you are even like puffing like like you know it's 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 the pretend version of 
of the real life. Now, now, what we've done over the last um, three weeks, we've kind of, we've kind of tried to build this whole story, and we said like love is a crazy thing, like like it's a big deal. There's this real thing called love, like it's intense. Like the Bible says in one Corinthians thirteen that love is large, it's incredibly patient, it doesn't keep record of wrong. It says love never stops loving. There's this big thing, and we said in the first week that men love is a crazy thing. In week two, we said marriage itself is a crazy thing. Like God brings us into an institution and he says, you know what? This is an example within a conversation that I'm having with humanity. And we said, man, this is crazy because the point is not even the person on the other side. We said the point of everything is Christ. Like this is a big deal. And then last week we were talking about how to be holy even when we're horny and, and we were saying that it's okay to be human. You can have human feelings, but it is not okay to live in the foolishness and limitation of humanity. And the truth is these things are a big deal. It's real. It's heavy. But is it possible that sometimes in the midst of that real thing, we just create our own pretend version, like our own watered down pretend version? Here's what I'm talking about. Now, some of you like to cook and then you like to be adventurous. Does it happen to you once in a while that you kind of just go online and just Google some random recipe? Like, let me just try out something at home. So you go online and you just Google like Indian dishes or something, right? And then, um, and then you now get maybe something like Indian um, butter chicken or something like that and then you now want to start this happens and, and i'll take a check in a moment you now want to start you now check out list of ingredients so um it, it now tells you boneless chicken or something um yeah like uh, we'll use normal chicken then there is like um there's like spices so there's like curry and uh, you're like oh yes I, yes 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 i have curry um there is like um so even if the indian curry you're like i'll use my own they're like um garlic you're like yes they're like you know they're giving you all those things then usually there'll be that one or two ingredients that you know that makes it an indian dish and why you don't eat it you know and so you see something like um freshly grown garden um um, um nut crackers or something something that you just you know like, eh. we'll do it without that right you just Anybody, right? Oh, good, 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 good. So you just basically try it out, you know, have this, yeah, you just try it. Um, usually what happens is that you will have a form, but you will deny the power. You, you get what I'm trying to There will be a form of the meal, but it will lack the, there will be something about it. That, amen, anybody? So there will be like a shape of it. It's chicken, it's chicken, it has, but something just seems to be missing in that. And I think, friends, that every single day of our lives and of our journey, I think we all face the temptation to just kind of water down a big deal. To kind of have this thing of there's a real thing, there's a weight, this is what it takes, this is the recipe of a love walk, this is a big deal. But I think we all face the temptation to just say, you know what, there are one or two ingredients there that are kind of heavy or hard. And so let's just build a story kind of without it. And so we kind of have the shape, we can be in the kind of actions, but something just seems to be missing. And I think it's a big temptation. Today I'm going to be speaking to you whether you're single, whether you're married. I I really believe that the Holy Spirit will make this message real to you because you know I grew up and there used to be these Niger children um usually that would um, children from Niger Republic that would be running after you and trying to beg for money and stuff like that and they could be so much of a nuisance they just basically try to disturb you until you are so angry that you just give them something and say get out that kind of a thing so this, these kids will basically come around you and then they'll be saying things they'll be saying prayers for you right and maybe you grew up used to hear those anybody used to used to you know okay not too many people okay okay good so, so when they're saying this let me check out your generation that you grew up let me wave your hands again let me see those in close to my generation okay so 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 basically basically they will start to say things to you that uncle auntie and then they're trying to speak your bad that they can't really speak and stuff like that so they would then start to say um, a number of prayers and stuff just to get you um, whipped up and then they would say different things but there's this line that i remember that they would usually say they would say things like any time motto racket care any something you know they, they just have that this and that then they'll get to that point they'll tell you that uncle any it's a GSM, ra calculator. And maybe you used to hear that and you're like, get out of here. But by the time I'm done today, I think you really go back and say amen to that prayer. Like it's a very huge prayer that you will not sell a mobile phone and buy a calculator. That you will not sell a mobile phone, buy a calculator and be like, Shebi is digit now, it's to press number. Do you understand that? You will not, amen anybody, you will not sell a, 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 a GSM 
to buy calculator. Let me look at somebody today and say, oh, Nita GSM RA calculator. <laughs> so, so, so in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4, let me start from here this morning. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4. Jesus is speaking to the church in Ephesus. This is resurrected Jesus. He's talking to the church in Ephesus. And then he's telling them, look, I have something against you. And it is this. Like Jesus comes to you and he says, you know what? I have an issue with you. You're like, Jesus, what issue? And then he's like, look, you don't have as much love as you used to have. Like you started out with something that was high intensity real. It was GSM. Then now you kind of have a form like it's just not as much as it used to be. It's like your GSM has become a calculator. And Jesus says that you don't have as much love as you used to. Let me show you the full context of this. In, if we started out from verse 1, Jesus comes to church and then he says, look, I know everything you have done, including your hard work and how you have endured. Now, if Jesus appears to you tonight, everybody, like Jesus just shows up in your room tonight and he's like, my name is Jesus. And you're like, oh my God. Oh, and all of that. And then he starts talking to you. Like, imagine Jesus is talking to you. And Jesus says, I know everything you have done. Some of you are like, ah, oh, Jesus, you know my browsing history. Calm down. This, this person is like, okay. And Jesus is saying your hard work and how you have endured. Can you see the smile brighten up on your face? Like, Jesus knows. Like, man, Jesus honestly wasn't easy enduring, but you know what? I endured. I did, man. You know, like this is the conversation you're having. And he says, I know you won't put up with anyone who is evil. When some people tried, some people pretended to be apostles, you tested them and you found out that they were liars. Like you fought hard fights for my sake. Jesus says you have endured and you have gone through hard times because of me you know we're already getting to that emotional moment like oh jesus thank you for finally coming like you recognize everything like man i did go through a lot and you have not given up then in verse four he now says but i have something against you ah after you've commended my endurance that i fought hard fights i did all of that you now say you have like i feel like if i can tick all those boxes why should jesus have something against me right and then what do you have against me that I know when you are fornicating? No. Jesus says, you don't have as much love as you used to have. What? Like, the intensity of your love just feels watered down. Like, you're just not where you once were. That you started out with, like, some intensity and you were overboard with love. When, and, 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 and just that thing that defines your life as a Christian. But now you just don't have as much. That's what Jesus was saying about the end times. That the love of many would wax cold. There's just that way. That thing, that intensity about loving and a love walk seems to have been watered down. That what was once real now looks like we're just pretending and we're just putting in actions that don't carry the weight of the real again. And it's a big deal because, you know, the Bible actually tells us that as Christians, we are identified in the place of a love walk. The Bible says that by this, John 13, 35, shall all men know that you are my disciples. How? If you, if you cast out demons, no. If you pray for 12 hours, no. He says, if you have love one for another. It says in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. That as a Christian, there must be an abiding of love. And Jesus says, now that I'm seeing it watered down, I know it's kind of there, but you are just not in the full weight of the recipe. Jesus says, I have this against you. I heard John Beaver say these words recently. He said, my goal in life is that on the day I die, I will love Jesus more than the first day. He said, my goal in marriage is that on the day I die, his wife is Lisa. I will love Lisa more than the first day. And I thought about that and how really that's how I want to live my life. I want to be building an intensity, not allowing it to get watered down. I don't want it to be that I once really loved, but now I've just kind of gotten cold in this whole conversation. And today, friends, I want to challenge us. I want to challenge us as single people. I want us to challenge us as married people that as we walk this love story, I'm going somewhere today, stay with me. I want to challenge us as, that as we walk this love story, do you know the truth is that it's not even just about you. It's not just about, you know, I heard two weeks ago about how love is a crazy thing and yeah, how do I feel about that and how marriage is a crazy thing so where am I in that conversation? Listen, it's not even just about you. We're going to find today that it's about your children. It's about your children's children. It's about generations that you will never even know because whatever God is doing in the life of a person is generational. When God works with anybody, it's not just about you. God sees people as nations. When God is speaking to you, he's talking about generations. He's seeing the fruit and the fruit and layers of your obedience and of the value that he's putting in your life. 
And today I want to say that, you know, God's kingdom stuff spans generations. It's not just about you, friends. It's generations. That the Bible would say God is the God of Abraham, but it doesn't just stop there. It would say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He will be talking, God will be talking about what he's doing in the layers of generations. When God is working with a man, God is speaking about generations. In fact, do you know that in Hebrews 7, when, when the Bible says that Abraham was, was, um, um, encountered Melchizedek, he was talking about how that when Abraham gave a tithe, Abraham simply was, you know, like you in a church service, um, and he's paying a tithe, and he's just giving to God. And the Bible says that in that moment, as Abraham is giving, Levi, that was generations and generations and generations. It says in Abraham's loins was also given because Abraham was given. In other words, God accounted what Abraham was doing to generations. That what God is doing in our lives is more than just us. Let me look at somebody and say, it's not just about you. It's about generations. Please stay with me. In Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 2, I'm going somewhere. Please stay with me. Ezekiel 18 and verse 2, the Bible says these words in NCV. It says, what do you mean by using this saying about the land of Israel? So he's talking about a, 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 um, a parable or what you call it, that they used to, like a saying that used to go around in Israel. And listen to this. It says, the parents have eaten sour grapes. And that, what the parents have eaten has caused the children to grind their teeth from the sour taste. In other words, the parents were eating something. The parents were eating something sour. But the taste is landing on the children. The parents are making decisions and choices. But the effect is coming on the children. The Bible says the, Bible says the parents are eating sour grapes and the taste is coming on the children. You read that in the Message Bible. It says that the parents are eating sour grapes, but the children got the stomachache. Look at that. The children got stomachache. Children are getting stomach ache for what their parents are eating. And I'm saying to you today that as we're talking about a conversation of a love walk, you see what I'm saying now? A love walk, I'm building a story of what God is doing in your life. I'm saying today that if we, if we take the direction of eating sour grapes, we're going to be putting a sour taste in the mouth of children. And honestly, I've seen layers and layers of this. I've seen layers and layers of destruction because of the poor choices that people made. We live in it every day. We live in it every day. There's a generation growing up and because of the choices parents made, children are, are becoming the victims of, of parents' brokenness. Children are becoming the victim of poor choices of parents, of the looseness of parents, of the promiscuity of parents. Children are the victims. We see it every day in the world in which we live. Some of you know it, that you've seen brokenness. You know it that you've grown up and you've seen brokenness and it, was just, it felt like just something you were watching but now you're finding that the sour taste is actually on me. And my parents ate sour grapes and the taste is on me. I can't count the number of times I've sat down with people, sometimes even in an addiction. A child battling a pornography addiction and you're trying to say, how did it even start? And he tells you, one of those days, I was just checking out my dad's box and just seeing the CDs he had and what he was just interested and keen. And here I am. And, and that's, that's basically how I, 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 I got opened into this. And layers and layers. I, I can't count the number of times that you're hearing a story and you're saying, man, this sounds like somebody else's mistakes. Some of you know what I'm talking about, that before you even knew what you were doing, before you even knew left from right, there was already just a direction of somebody else's poor choices. And the Bible is talking about that. He says, look, the parents eat sour grapes and the children are having the sour taste in their mouth. And I'm asking today, how are we going to build our love story? Are we going to be the kind of people that have this thing we want to cook? Yes, we can see what it takes and what the conversation of love is all about. And it's a large thing. It's a big thing. This is God's standard. But we kind of get to those things on the recipe that just kind of feel hard. And so we just, you know what, just drop it and take a sour grape and put it into the conversation. Because as we put the sour grape in the conversation, it's not just a meal that we are eating. We are cooking it for generations. Please stay with me today. Are we feeding on sour grapes where we should be feeding on the freshness of something God is doing in our lives? Are we, are we satisfied to feed on sour grapes as we lean over the disappointment and the pain and the frustration, the brokenness and all of that? Are we satisfied to feed on sour grapes? Are we looking out for the freshness of God's standards that he calls us to? 
I believe that the devil will do anything to lead a people to feed on sour grapes. Because the devil knows that if you are feeding on sour grapes, the devil knows that it is generational, that the taste is getting to generations. The devil knows he can destroy another generation. It's not just your children, it's the whole world. It's a generational influence, friends. Listen, no matter the sweet grapes I eat, all right, and I say, oh, I'm eating sweet grapes, I am going to pass on a sweet taste to my children. Do you know the truth? My children are still going to go to school with the children of people that ate sour grapes. It's a generation. And the devil knows that he can attack a generation by just making more people just pick sour grapes and and layers and layers. And we think it's just about me and it's my decisions, but it's layered. It's generational. I don't know about you, but sometimes growing up, I used to read the Bible and, you know, you see these stories in the Bible and you're just like, God, uh, 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 you shall skip it because you can't talk. Give you an example. You see stuff that maybe somebody did, like like Akan. They said, "Don't take anything." Akan stole and he hid it. Nobody knew. They now start searching, searching. They now found that it was Akan. When they now find this one, they now say, "Oh yeah, Akan, your wife, your children, everybody connect your animals." They will stone all of them to death. The ground will open and swallow them. Ah, hey, but his children. I, I, is it only me that ever just thinks? So? Some of you are like, I understand. <laughs> But honestly, sometimes you're like, what's there with? But, but I think it carries, a, it, it, it carries an example for us to see how these things work. That the poor choices one person is making is not just about them. That the poor choices I'm making is about lineage. It's about generations. It's about, it's about the expressions out of my life. Now we're feeding on sour grapes. Have we allowed the world to water down our recipe of the standards that God calls us to? I'll say to you today, friends, that it is what we live, it is what we live in that we can live for another generation. It is the life that we live that we can live. I remember many years ago, I was on campus sitting down with a young lady, and it was one of those moments, somebody has a question, doesn't want to come, and then we finally got to have a conversation, and she said to me, she said, Pastor, that, you know what, my boyfriend wants to sleep with me, and yes, I initially thought it was wrong, I started out from thinking it was wrong, but the truth is, this guy is really nice, he's really, really nice, he loves me, in fact, what he says to me is that he has loved me in every way that he can, that that is the only other expression of love that he can, you know, express to me, something like that, that's basically what he tells her. By the way, can we just say that if God is love, the expression of God can never be morality. Amen? And so if it is love, it will never end in immorality. Amen, anybody? And so this guy tells her that, you know what, he's so nice and he really loves her. And she tells me that she starts out from the place that she thinks sleeping with him is wrong. But now she's in a place where because of how nice he is and all of that, she thinks, is it really wrong? And is it not just another expression? And they're committed and after all, they will get married. And you know, just all of that kind of story. And so I was with her and I asked her, I said, how old are you? She said she's 17. And this was, this was maybe like 15 years ago. She was in 100 level and came from a broken home you know just that kind of story and and so i'm saying okay 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 but the more i was trying to say but don't you see what god's word says she was just like oh but this guy is so nice okay anyway so i just say okay you know what let's just think about the future don't worry forget about guy let's just talk about the future where do you want to be where do you want to settle down with your family so we start talking about that where do you see yourself in 30 years what do you would like to do um uh, with lecture is frustrating how do you want to graduate blah 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 so we just start pushing the conversation forward talking about how many children do you want to have how do you want a girl before a boy so we're just going in all of that, all of that conversation. Where would you like to live? Where would you like to settle? Can you imagine some of those families? And she's all that, 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 that. So we're in that conversation. And then somewhere in that, just like, can you imagine one day your daughter just comes to you, your 17-year-old daughter just runs to you and says, Mommy, my boyfriend in school wants to sleep with me. What should I do? And she just said, Never! But then I said, On what moral ground? Because she's going to ask you, Mom, what did you do when you were my age? Are you going to tell her, Will you shut up? Do what I tell you to do? Or are you going to sit down and tell her stories? And as she began to say that, and, and, and she began to cry, and she said, you know what, I'm never going to do this. And that night, in fact, man, don't tell people to break relations. She told me that, you know, Pastor, tonight I'm breaking this relationship. I said, ah, we're done, you know. <laughs> you know. And she did. It was simply a person realizing that my life is not just about how I feel in the moment. It's about generations. And if God will bless us with that objectivity of wisdom, of seeing, I think many of us that just eat sour grapes because of how we feel, because of what's going on and just what the pressure we face. We're just eating sour grapes, sour grapes, but we don't realize that we are setting the teeth of another generation on edge. 
I want to tell you three things that I believe the devil will try and do in any generation. Three things in this love walk that we are called to and how we want to hold the values of love that God calls us to. Three temptations that you are going to face as you build your love story. And I'm taking the three things from, from the temptations of Jesus. Matthew chapter 4 from verse 1 to 10. Jesus is tempted. The Bible says Jesus has been fasting for 40 days and he's really hungry. Now, let's check out three things because I grew up and I used to read the three temptations of Jesus as like, you know, very literal that, you know, turn stone to bread, jump down. You remember the temptations, jump down from the highest point of the temple. And then the third one was to bow down and be rich. So I even used to ask that. So that if Jesus bowed down, did he like bow down completely? Was it small or is it to prostrate? You know, I just used to picture it and I never really understood. But, but let's check out three things that they might mean to us in our love walk. So the first thing is that the devil comes to Jesus and he tells him, you know what, turn this stone to bread. And do you know the first temptation every one of us is going to face in this thing of our love work is to use our power or to use our ability to satisfy our hunger. The ability that you have, the power that you have. Because listen, it was a temptation because Jesus had the power to do it. That's why it's a temptation. You don't tempt people with what they can't do. Some of you don't have a passport and I'll come and I tell you, I'm tempting you to go to America. I'm tempting you. It's not a temptation. You can't go. Yeah, yeah. All right? But you have a passport, you're on the queue to board, and then I'm like, don't go. I'm tempting your hair. That's temptation. So the devil comes to you and he says, turn stone to bread because Jesus has the power to do it. And listen, he had the power to do it. We're still going to see that power at work just down the road when he's going to multiply bread to feed thousands. Because that is what the power was given for, to serve others, not for your own hunger. Jesus, the problem is not with bread. The problem is not with bread. We're going to see Jesus in scripture, you know, going to eat bread, to give people bread, to make fish burger for Peter. Um, Bread around. Bread is not the problem. The problem is the heart behind the bread. The problem is that now I have ability and I have power. And it's all about my hunger. Because let's be honest, Jesus was really hungry. He's been fasting for 40 days. Amen. Some of you did 21 days surge. You are looking like somebody that 40 days straight. He's hungry. And he has the power. But he's showing us a principle that in the place of power, in the place of ability, in the place of what I can do, don't let it be about your hunger. And I know that you might really be hungry this morning. Maybe you are single and you feel so hungry for a marriage, hungry for a relationship, hungry for... I just want to say that, can I remind you that Jesus was truly hungry, but his hunger was never going to kill him. I pray you would remember. The hunger was never going to kill him. Um, I know it feels like, ah, it will come and go. Amen. Don't pick a sour grape because of the hunger of the moment. And how many people in a marriage, we use our power against each other, our ability against each other. We use it for self. Do you know how many people go into a marriage and it's just about me? It's about somebody to give me satisfaction, somebody to carry the bodies of my life, somebody to give me joy, somebody to give me peace, somebody to redeem me. It's not about your hunger, friends. That we are called to serve one another. We are called to use our power, not to pursue our own hunger. Amen, anybody. This is how people start to take sour grapes. Sour grapes. So it becomes a, a, a power thing, a power torso, and the taste is on the children. The second temptation that Jesus faced was that the Bible says the devil led him to the, to, to the holy city and set him upon the pinnacle of the temple, the highest point of the temple, one translation says. And then he tells him, jump down, and I will give, and you know, he says he will give his angels charge over you. And I think this is a big temptation that we're all going to face in our love walk. It's this thing of as we rise. I think it's interesting that the Bible says to the highest point of the temple. I think it's a picture. That as we rise in a journey of spirituality. As we are, you know, you started out kind of just around, you know. Now you are rising in a journey of spirituality. And we now get to spiritual heights where we start to feel we can take risks. We get to spiritual heights where we start to feel nothing will happen. You know, the language of this, I believe, is that I go deal right. I go deal right. You know, when we started out this whole thing, when you, were, when you just gave your life to Christ, you, you know how you would see some things and you would flee, but now because you are deep, what's it deep, girl? You now understand seven dynamics of grace. It doesn't move you again. I go deal right. The Bible says the devil was leading Jesus higher in that spiritual journey. 
And it was now a temptation to just take chances, take risks. You don't need to be accountable again. You don't need to, you know, you don't, you, you have grown, you have matured, right? And I'm just saying, friends, many of us in this conversation of a love story start to make poor decisions. He will give his angels charge. I won't be hurt. I'll be fine. You know how in those days, the same things you would, when you fell into temptation, you would cry and, and you know, be broken and it would move your heart and all of that. And, and I'm not saying repentance is about the tears. Oh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's about emotions. But uh, I'm saying it should matter to you than just coming to say that there's one depth of understanding you now have. And now I have a fresh revelation of grace. Don't climb to the top of the temple and make yourself stupid. Climbing to the top of the temple should be deeper worship and deeper reverence for God. Not an, an, an opportunity to start taking chances to live life anyhow. No structures, no, no, no values again to your life, no disciplines. You know, you go there, all right, even if I don't do that, I used to do that, but no, 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 no. And I'm just saying, it was a temptation that Jesus faced. And many people start to eat sour grapes in this space. We start to do all kinds of things in our love story because we just have that feeling of, oh, we go there, all right. The third temptation is that the Bible says that the devil led Jesus up on the mountain and he showed him the kingdoms of the world and all this stuff. And then he tells him, he says, bow down to me and I'll give it all to you. And what was really going on in this moment? Jesus is seeing the pleasures. Jesus is seeing all that he can come into. And in this moment, let me show you what's happening in this moment. It is simply Jesus seeing all the pleasures and all the desire and all the things I can want to have and I feel like having. But... Lower your standards to get to them. You know, your standards are too high. You're standing upright. Bow. It's 2022. You don't have to have all this intensity of standards and things that you believe. Like just kind of lower your standards to come into those things. And we all know how this works out. You know, there are things on the other side of compromise. You know, amen, anybody? Things on the other side of compromise. Just a little compromise. Your standards are too high. You can get some good business deals if only you just go clubbing. You can get some. It's just it's your standards that are too. You know, just lower it a bit. Or the other way is Satan simply saying, go through what I represent to come into it. Bow down to me to have it. Go through systems that I represent to come into that. And we can all see it on the other side and it's real. It's not about bowing down to one stone anywhere. I mean, I will never worship idol. But, but here you are, compromising to get stuff. Compromising to come into that. And I think about how so many of us just deal with that space of coming into sour grapes because we're being tempted. The devil will do anything to just make us put in sour grapes in our conversation um, as we walk this love story. So my challenge to us, everybody, whether you're single or you're married, my challenge to you today is that we, we rediscover the weight of this love work that we are called to. God's, God's loud standards, God's, um, God's huge, heavy standards that we are called to live in. And maybe you're hearing everything I'm saying today and you're saying, no, you don't get, you don't understand the problem. The problem is that it is not even about me eating sour grapes. It's about the sour grapes that another generation ate. And all I am dealing with here is the sour taste. You don't understand what's happening. It's the sour taste. I didn't even know what was happening before I was already a victim. It was somebody else's mess up. It was somebody else's misbehavior. I was abused. I was, I was raped. I was, and I'm here with the sour taste because of somebody else's sour grapes. Somebody else had made poor choices. Somebody else had, had decided that, you know, my parents were always in this tussle about who is right, who is right, who is right. They were just in a power tussle and they didn't realize they were leaving us, the children, as victims. Because every time one of them was winning a battle, they didn't know they were losing a war. They were losing generations and we were just watching all the fights going on and dad sat back at the end and he has like, he has proved this point but he didn't understand that in proving the point we were becoming the victims and you look at yourself and maybe it was absenteeism of parents or generational mistakes or one uncle somewhere and all of that. But just that sense of I am the one dealing with the sour taste here. And honestly, friends, it's real. If we would even be honest, in some way or the other, every one of us has some level of a sour taste. That was placed on us, either by parents or by a country, or anything. Maybe you inherited a sour taste. As so I was thinking about that this morning, scripture comes to my mind in John and chapter 19. 
But Jesus is on the cross and he has done, he has lived his whole life and everything and now he has gone up on the cross and suddenly in John chapter 19, Jesus shouts out and he says, hey man, I'm about to give up my spirit but something more. He shouts and says, I'm thirsty and the Bible says, give me verse 29, a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine and they put it on his up and they put it to his mouth. And in verse 30, the Bible says, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. I just stopped by today to encourage somebody who says, you don't understand. It's the sour taste of my parents. It's the sour taste from what they did. I just came to encourage somebody to say, hey, your Savior knows about it. And he went up that cross. He climbed up that cross and said, give me the sour taste. Give me the sour taste. I'll take it for you. I'm not going to die until I take that sour taste. I know you're supposed to be a victim. I know you're supposed to be feeling the taste of what they did and all the mistakes they had made. I know you were born into a generation of wrong. I know everything had been said wrong and you didn't even start from where you were supposed to start but we have a savior who went up on a cross and in his death he said give me the sour taste there's what it means to be in Christ Jesus that we can lay the sour taste on him and listen you may not be the child of Abraham like Abraham is my daddy he did everything right father of faith so I happen to be Isaac you may not be the child of Abraham but listen you can choose today to be the father of Isaac you can start a new genealogy you can start something fresh you can receive you can live out the sad taste in a generation I'm putting I'm sick and tired of everybody talking so much about our bloodlines and what my daddy did you sit down in a one hour conversation you've talked about your daddy 20 times and what he did and I understand that it's painful but what I'm saying is can we remember what our Jesus did even when our, our parents failed us in the natural can we remember that we have a savior who took the sarte and said it is finished therefore if any man be in Christ Jesus he is a new creation all things have passed away behold all things have become new let me show you Ezekiel chapter 18 from verse 1 to 3 now let me read it in full because Ezekiel was actually prophesying of a time to come when he quoted this. And in Ezekiel chapter 18 from verse 1, the Lord spoke his word to me saying, What do you mean by using this proverb in, uh, in, in the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes and that caused the children to grind their teeth from the sour taste. Listen to verse 3. God says, as surely as I live. So Ezekiel is prophesying and saying, guys, there will be a time to come because of what Jesus will do. Now look at this. God says, as surely as I live, says the Lord God. God, this is true. You will not use this saying in Israel anymore. I came to say to somebody today, as surely as God lives, you will not use that saying over your life again. That is the sour taste of my parents. It's the mistake of a generation. You can build your love story. You can honor your family. You can be a present parent. You don't have to repeat the brokenness. You don't have to repeat generations of pain. You can start a new thing because God is at work in you. He says it will not be said over you again. The parents have eaten sour grapes. Why are you still here? It's my parents. It's my parents. It's my parents. It will not be said over you again. Not because of what they did. Because of the, somebody was to be there that was not there when they was to be there. I know and I understand. In the natural, you can argue those. But it's not about winning arguments. Listen, it's about understanding that God has called you to build a story. And I believe God is starting something fresh with you. I believe in the place of what the devil meant for evil. God is still able to work it for good. Amen, anybody? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Stop justifying failure. Jesus took the sour wine for you. Jesus took the sour wine for you. Please come on the keyboard. Let me close this morning. In closing this morning, I was thinking about, they had this practice in the Old Testament. The Old Testament speaks quite a bit about it. They call it a covenant of salt. And basically what happens is that um, two people come into a covenant and they use salt. God speaks about in Chronicles about making a covenant with us by salt. You have references to it around. And it was even a practice in marriages in those days that they would come into a covenant of salt. And what would happen is that two people would come with salt, with like, um, what do you call it? Like um, containers of salt. Two people would come with salt. They would come to each other. And they would pour their salt into the same, um, you know, container. They would both pour their salt together. And what they're saying to each other is that I'm giving you everything I am. And that except you can take this salt and separate the grains I poured from the grains you poured, then we are bonded. And so they're saying that we're making a covenant with each other by 
giving ourselves to each other. That if you want to break this covenant, you want to break this covenant we've made, we've got to separate our salt. Come and start picking, pick your own. No, that one is your own. That one is your own. But if you cannot separate our salt, then they are saying that there is a covenant between us. So, so they used to use that thing in marriages and make a covenant of salt between themselves. And it's a heavy thing. And as I was thinking about that this morning, I was thinking of it in two ways. And this is going to be my challenge as I close this morning. I was thinking about single people. By single people, I mean unmarried people. Whatever state, whether married, formerly married, whatever. But unmarried people who have their salt. It's like God has given you this salt. And are going through life just putting bits and pieces and bits and pieces pouring out, pouring out, pouring out, leakages, leakages, leakages. And then they get to a place where they want to come into a God-ordained covenant and there's just no salt to pour. Because they are emotionally tied there. They, there was that fling, there was that one, that one, that one. You know, just stories and bits and pieces and all of that. And so where they come to and there should be the giving of myself the question is who am I because I'm divided in 20 places and I was thinking about married people also in that covenant of salt and where we're supposed to pour and that absoluteness there's like a holding back it's like I put a little but not everything because I'm just and so married people that should be pouring into something it's you know there's kind of like a plan B there is this traditional thought somebody told me that if you give yourself entirely and something goes wrong after five years so it's good to just always have an escape option you know where we should be poured in just that sense of holding back and as I was thinking about that this morning and about how, you know, God gives us the privilege of that salt. It's interesting because in many ways, God, Jesus would even say you're the salt of the earth. There are references about our words as salt and what have you. And, and it's interesting because as single people, you may not realize that you might just be on a journey of a love walk and just doing a little here, a little there, a little there, a little there, a little there. But we don't understand that there's a story we were actually anointed to be telling that it feels like we are taking something away from. We're taking value away from. When we should come into it in the fullness of what God calls us to be, it's just the power to bond is just weakened. The power to be there is just not there. And I'm saying this in every regard that you think about yourself, emotionally and sexually and, you know, mentally and every regard you think of yourself. I'm talking about the sense of integrity and wholeness that God calls us to live with. I'm saying it also to married people. To remember that God invites us to a journey of pouring our salt and not holding back as we honor him with this. So maybe you hear everything I'm saying today and you say, oh yeah, good stuff. And I really look forward to generations of walking a love story that would inspire generations and all of that. So my wife told me at some point, we're having a conversation just how do you think I'm doing? How are you doing? We just like to get feedback from each other. And that day, what, so maybe a year or two ago, we're having this conversation. My wife said something to me that never left me. Great woman. And she said that she feels that in some way um, you are post-dating. I said, what do you mean? And she said to me that there's a sense of there are many things on your heart. Many things you want to be with your children. There are many things you want to do. And it just feels like you're kind of here now, but there's that big sense in your heart of one day, one day, one day, like when they're of this age, when they get to that point. And I said, baby, you are so right. I see it. Now, many of us think of great things and influence of generations. And it's like one day when I get there, you know, when, when, one, of, one of the big ones, will be, when I'm settled, when I'm settled. In fact, when I'm settled, I will so give to just to bless the gospel. Huh? Honestly, when I'm settled. <laughs> settled. If you're writing, write this down. That word is a scam. <laughs> but we just post it. It's like it's somewhere there. One day when my children, when, when my children grow up, I will sit them down and honestly, before my children go to school, I'm going to have a strong conversation with them about what to do, what to look out for in the opposite sex, how to hold their values, how to do this, how to do that. I'm going to. Nice. It's good. One day, when my children are about to get married, I will sit them down and talk to them. You know, just that sense of what I will do. 
And so we almost think about the influence of God in our lives and through our lives as something to come. Many years ago, 2009, I was, I was about graduating from university. I schooled in OAU, one of the big privileges I have in life. If you didn't experience that privilege, pray in another lifetime. Pray for your children. Pray. Yes. You, you schooled in UI. Pray. Affliction shall not rise a second time. Pray. It. Pray. It's sour taste. It's anyway. So, so, so. So, so. I, I, I schooled in Ife. I remember when I was about graduating. I'd been on, in school for five years. I just felt this burden. I wanted to do like a meeting, like a, a teaching meeting. Like, ah, we're about leaving school. Let's call people and, you know, bless them. So, so I decided I was going to do a five-hour teaching meeting. Five hour. Those kind of things just to, 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 be, to shock us there. Now I preach. I preach and look there. They're writing for me time up. I don't, you, don't, you don't fear God. Anyway, so, 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 so I, I remember I was going to do a five-hour teaching meeting. And this morning as I came, I just felt God say to me, teach what you wanted to teach that day. So I'll start now. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. So I remember that I was looking forward to it. I prayed, prepared. We're going to start 7 a.m., run till 12 noon and just teach. Just Israel in your Jacob. People like Victor Agun were there. Aki, were you there? Aki, I'm sure was there. You know, people that, 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 that star. <laughs> So I remember, I remember getting to the venue that morning early, talked in, ready to go, ready to pour. And then I got there. And you know when, the Bible, when you read in your Bible things like Satan entered Judas, and you're like, hey, how does this happen? I know how it happens. There was this security guy there that day who was in charge. Literally, Satan entered him. He just decided we will not have that meeting. We had booked the venue. We had what's happening. He just says that we can't. And then he just starts ranting and saying all kinds of things that nobody can talk to him. That only the provost of health sciences, it was somewhere in health sciences, only the provost can call him. He cannot talk to anybody. His colleagues called him. He started abusing them, fighting. I mean, he was just going, going, going bizarre, going on us, like literally shouting, saying nobody can have a program. 7 a.m., 7.30, 8 o'clock, like... We begged, we talked, we called people, we did everything we knew to do. This guy was just ranting. Remember at some point just crying and saying what I'm... The guy would now even just be playing with our emotions. So one time he just called us and I said, okay, come, come. We're well, like three, he called us. And I said, what department are you? I said, I'm in law. He said, what level? I said, 500. He said, oh, you have almost graduated. I said, yes. He said, you. The guy said, economics, 400. He said, ah, you have almost got... One guy was engineering, maybe 400. He said, ah, you have almost graduated. We thought he was... He now said, so now... I am the security. You are students. You are begging me. Very soon you will graduate. You will become a guy. You will now come and be telling me, go there, go there. Go. <sighs> like literally Satan entered him. I don't know how else to say it. And I remember it was past eight. I was crying. And I just got to this point where I said, you know what? I'm not even doing this thing again. I've canceled it. It's not going to hold. I was about to go upstairs and tell everybody, you know what, guys, just go. I'm not holding this program again. I'm sorry. We plan to do it. I think it was 7th November 2009. I'm sorry. Some of you are like, guys, there was born. I'm sorry. We're, <laughs> we're not going to do this and all of that. I was already just frustrated. But before I did that, I needed to tell one of my mentors because, I mean, he was in the know of what I was doing and all. I needed to tell him. I was thinking of how to avoid telling him, but I had to tell him. So I remember picking up my phone and calling him. I was crying on the phone and I said, uh, you know what? I'm canceling the program. He said, why? I said, we have this venue issue, blah, blah, blah. And then he said to me, I know now. Why don't you go and use this other venue? I said, it's not realistic. We can't do that. He said, oh, okay, true, true, true. Uh, he was in the hospital. He was doing a ward round. He said, uh, that, you know what? I'm in the hospital. I can't really talk now. And I'm like, you know, I just called to tell you that I'm canceling it. That's why I just wanted to tell you before I go upstairs to cancel it. And he said, no, don't cancel it. And then he said these words to me that never left me. He said to me, you know, you wanted to do a five-hour teaching meeting. You wanted to start at seven and end at 12 and teach, teach, teach. He said to me, the teaching meeting is already on. How you're handling this, how you're responding, you're already teaching. I don't know what you're going to do. Don't cancel that program. Have a nice day. I got to go. Bam. Thank you. Aspire to perspire. Thank you. <laughs> what am I going to do? But I realized that I thought teaching was about having a platform and starting to break revs. 
But how I was responding in the moment where I was crying, I was already teaching. How I was responding in faith, how I was responding to offense, to bitterness, to, to somebody being negative. I was already teaching and, and I came to tell somebody today, I know you're thinking about when my life gets to the point that they will gather my story and write my legacy. But listen, you're already living it. How you're responding to the heartbreak, to the offense, to what they're doing, to the excuses. We already walk in this story. My encouragement to you today is don't let sour grapes get in the recipe of what God is doing in your life. Don't let it become a sour love. Don't let it become a love story. That because the ingredients were heavy, we just decided to take something convenient and go with the sour grapes. But I pray today that we would hear those words, love is large, and we would say, yes, we're standing up to a large love. And marriage is a crazy thing, but thank God he's working it in us. And yes, there's all of this going on, but we will not cheapen the standard. We will live our life. Maybe you're going back home tonight to cry. I, and it's human. I cry a lot. Yes, maybe you're going home to cry because you don't have answers. All I'm saying is that even till the answers come, you're already living a story. And I pray you would live it with integrity, with wholeness. Maybe you're waiting. Maybe you're in a season you can't explain. I pray you would walk it with integrity and with wholeness. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Um, okay, some of you are standing. Thank you. Can, can everybody stand? Let me read for you Proverbs in chapter 5. And I'll read from verse, seven, from verse 7. I want to read this especially for every single person in church today. Every unmarried person in church today. And um, I'm going to lead you to say some words and then we'll get into a vow renewal moment. So Proverbs chapter 5 from verse 7. Everybody who is unmarried, please hear these words well. God speaking, he says, Therefore, hear me now, my children. And do not depart from the words of my mouth. Remove your way far from her, talking about the adulterous woman, and do not go near the door of her house. Lest you give your honor, your salt, your value to others, and your years to the cruel one. Lest aliens be filled with your wealth, and your labors go to the house of a foreigner, and you mourn at last. When your flesh and your body are consumed and you say how I have hated instruction and my heart despised correction. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor inclined my ear to those who instructed me. I was on the verge of total ruin even though I was in the midst of the assembly and the congregation. So it says in verse 15, drink water from your own cistern and run in water from your own well. Hear this well, should your fountains be dispersed abroad? Streams. It's one of the scriptures that saved me from masturbation. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad? Streams of water in the streets. Let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. Your emotional energy, your passion, your focus. Don't let it go to strangers. Hold your salt. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. Now, I want everybody in church this morning who is unmarried, I'm going to lead you to say some words and if it's fine, would you say after me? Say, in the name of Jesus, I commit to a life of love and of following Jesus, of integrity and of wholeness. Say, I will not live for less. I will live a life of honor. I will not pour my value to strangers I will be whole and honorable emotionally sexually and spiritually now say I do not eat sour grapes I do not water down God's standards I live for what is true I live for what is right and I will stand the test of time in Jesus name who says amen to that? Amen. It's okay to clap your hands and give God the praise. Now, while we're still standing, I want to make an invitation. Somebody came to church this morning and you're not in the right place with God. You see, there's only one way you can be made right with God. And it's by consciously surrendering the lordship of your life to Jesus. 
We don't get right with God because we kind of work harder and all of that. We get right with God because we surrender. You know, we serve a Savior, Jesus, who went up on a cross and died a death he didn't deserve to die so that we can have a life we don't deserve to have. I don't know who you are today or how you got to be in church. Maybe you've made poor decisions in life. Maybe you're living under the weight and the condemnation of sin and of guilt. But today, would you love to be forgiven? Would you love the love of a Savior today? If you say, you know what, you're speaking to me, I want to be made right with God. Can I just ask everybody to bow their heads, close their eyes. Let's stand, everybody, as we honor your decision today. And as we bow our heads and close our eyes, I'm going to count to three and say, if you're there, you say, you know what, you're speaking to me. I'm not in the right place with God. Maybe at some point in your life you had been there, but you know as we speak today, you've walked away from it. We'd love to lead you in a miracle. I'll ask you to put your right hand on your chest wherever you are this morning, whether you're in this building or you're online anywhere. Are you ready? A miracle is about to happen in your life. One, two, three. Put your hand on your chest where you are. God sees you and he knows you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for your sincerity. God bless you. Anybody else want to join in? Please do. God bless you. Across the room, God bless you. If you're online, also join in. God bless you. It's a miracle happening in your life. Please don't hold back on God. God bless you. God bless you. Just put it on your chest where you are. God bless you. He sees you. He knows you. If you're online alone in that room, God sees you right now and he knows you. And it's a miracle happening in your life. I'm going to ask the whole church to say a prayer together. This is a family, not a crowd. If you put your hand on your chest, I want you to say these words with boldness, knowing that God hears you and he sees you. The Bible says, we believe with our hearts and with our mouths we confess unto salvation. Can we all say together, Heavenly Father, I come to you today because you've made a way for me to come through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of your son, Jesus. Say, so I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is the son of God and he's the savior of the world. So I believe he died in my place so that I can be made right with you. Say today, I confess Jesus as my savior and my Lord. Say I give everything to follow you. I will live for you. I'll stand for you. Say please fill me with your grace and I'll never be the same. And I'll say one day, I'll be with you in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.